This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. If not, um, if you can go down the pad, I, I, I guess I've been trying to motion to you that you're focused way, way off in the wrong place there. You're going to want to move over here. There we go. So if you go down to the pad, we'll, we'll uh, finish off uh, our coverage of SVD. So we go, we'll go to just uh, matrix solving a square system of equations, y equals ax. So you have n equations, uh, n unknowns, that's y equals ax. And of course the solution is nothing but a inverse y. So that's, that's the solution. Now we're going to look at what would happen if y were off a little bit. y might be off a little bit for many reasons. It could be it could be as innocent as a floating point round off, or it could be that y is measured uh, with finite precision, which of course is always the case. Is that like twisted at an angle of 10 degrees for you? Okay, just curious. Um, all right, uh, getting closer. Okay, well, well, we'll just not worry about it. That's, that's still twisted, but that's okay. Um, so. We'll look at what happens when y varies. Now, of course, if y varies a little bit, then x will vary a little bit, and, and the change in x will be a inverse delta y. And last time, I think I, I pointed this out, that if you have a matrix which is invertible, non-singular, but, but where the inverse is huge, and of course, that, this is exactly what you'd get if you had a matrix uh, which was, for example, singular, and then you perturbed it slightly to make it non-singular. You will have a matrix that's now non-singular, but its inverse is going to be huge. Now, when a matrix has an inverse that's huge, you can solve y equals ax. No problem. That's what it means to be invertible. Here's the problem right here. It says that tiny errors in, del in y will, can become extremely large errors in delta x. Okay? So that means that it may mathematically be invertible, but it is of no it's of no particular practical use. I mean, unless you're willing to certify that there are no errors in y uh, out at the uh, 15th digit or something like that. So that's the, the difference. Okay. If you want to bound that, you can say that the norm of delta x is going to be less than or equal to the norm of a inverse times norm of delta y. So in this sense, it says when you see that the norm of the inverse matrix is huge, that's a hint that small, small perturbations in y can lead. It does not mean it's guaranteed to. It means can lead to large changes in x. OK. Now, when you're looking at whether at, 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 a, at a perturbation, like, for example, uh, delta y or delta x, one of these things, as to whether or not it's big or small, uh, a far better measure than simply the absolute number is the, the, relative, is the relative error. And relative error is something like this. It's delta x over x. So if this is, for example, 0 0.01 delta x over x, you can, you can basically just say that means it's off by about, it's off by, say, 1%. And the same here. For example, if you have a 10-bit A to D when you, count, when, you, when you measure Y, assuming Y is a measurement, then this would say over here, this says something, this number here would be less than or equal to something on the order of 0.1%. That's 2 to the minus 10, roughly. Okay. Now, you, by noting that Y in norm is, is no bigger than the norm of a times norm of x, and then simply dividing this inequality by the previous one, you get a very, very important inequality. We looked at this last time. And it's this. It says that the relative error in x is no bigger than the relative error in y times the norm of a times the norm of a inverse. Now, this comes up all the time, norm a, norm a inverse, and it's got a name. It's called a condition number. It's sometimes written uh, cond a. So that's it's a very famous uh, quantity. It's often uh, use, you denoted using kappa. Now, a couple of, and you can write it in terms of the singular values uh, easily, because the norm of a is, of course, the largest singular value of a. A inverse, the singular values of a inverse are one over the singular values of a. Therefore, the largest singular value of a inverse 
is 1 over the smallest singular value of A. So you get this. It's the, it's the spread in the singular values, the range. Now, by the way, geometrically, this is an anisotropy. That's what this is. If this is 2, it says that the gain of the matrix varies no more than a factor of 2 with direction. That's, that's, what the, that's, that's the meaning of this. It says that the image of the unit ball under A will, will map into an ellipsoid that is not too skewed. No semi-axis is more than a factor of 2, if 2 is what this is, more, uh, it, well, just 2, period. Uh, no semi-axis is a factor of 2 longer than any other semi-axis. That's, that's what this says. So this, is, this, you can think of the condition number as, an, as a measure of being not isotropic. In other words, it's, it's, it's how much the gain varies as a function of direction. That, that's what, exactly what the condition number is. Let's see, a couple of uh, things to note about it. I mean, you, have some home, you'll have, you will have some homework problems on this, but some are obvious. Um, one is that this number is always bigger than 1. Okay, so it's, it's always bigger than 1. The second is the following. Oh, that's obvious because it's the maximum singular value divided by the minimum singular value. Uh, another factor is it's homogeneous. If I multiply A by 10, the condition number doesn't change. Okay, so the condition number in no way changes. That makes sense because we're doing relative error here. So that makes perfect. See, if I multiply by 10, each of these goes up by 10, or if you like, this goes up by 10, that goes down by 10. And it's preserved, preserves the condition number. Okay, so this is normally interpreted something like this. The relative error in the solution x is less than or equal to the relative error in the data y multiplied by the condition number. That's a bound. Okay, so, however, it's become, I guess in the 60s, maybe in early 70s, things like this weren't appreciated uh, deeply enough. Um, it, as it spread, it's actually now, it, it became in fact a little, almost even counterproductive because it sort of became almost like a religious thing. Uh, in other words, that people would simply, would simply say, oh, condition number is too high, forget it. Uh, turns out this is just an inequality. And in fact, there's lots of cases where due to special structure in A, this does not, it, this actually works. It, you can have a condition number of 10 to the 8, and actually the solutions are computed reliably. So in other words, the, there's actually no uh, change in the relative error. Of course, there you have to look, this is just a bound, and there you have to look more into the actual properties of A. But there are many problems like that. In fact, some that were abandoned, there were methods abandoned in the 70s on the basis of large condition number. So people would say, oh, the condition number of those matrices is huge. You can't do that. Everyone knows that's bad practice. Um, it turned out actually the solutions were being computed quite accurately. But these methods were then uh, out of circulation for like 30 years and then rehabilitated maybe five, 10 years ago. So, okay. So it, even lo and the, a looser way to say this is you take the log base two of both sides and you actually get something that's kind of, a, it's, it's actually a very good way to put it. It says something like this. It says that the number of bits of accuracy in the solution is about equal to the number of bits of accuracy in the data minus log two of the condition number. Okay, so, and let's, let's, let, me, let, me judge, let me say a little bit about what that means. Uh, what I'm saying is something like this. If, if, um, if, if this number is, let's say, 1%, if that's 0.01, it basically says, I know x to 1%. If I know x to 1%, it takes about, uh, in that case, oh, somebody help me out. 128 is uh, 8? No, 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 7. But six and a half, okay? So that's six and a half bits. I should have taken 1,000, shouldn't I? So let's make this 0.1%, because that one I know. That's 2 to the minus 10. So if this, is point one, if, if this number is 0 0.001, then this thing here uh, it basically says there's about 10 bits of accuracy in these. Now, that's not quite right, because this is norms of vectors, and it's not the same as the norms of the, en the individual entries and all that, the absolute values of the entries. But roughly speaking, we'll say that there's about 10 bits of accuracy in, in, in this at that point. Certainly, the 15th bit in any component of delta x is meaningless. That is certainly the case here. So if you accept that definition of what it means of, uh, to have the number of bits of accuracy, then this is actually correct. And what this says is that when you solve linear equations, when you invert equations, what happens is the following. Uh, when you solve linear, oh, I should, I should mention, by the way, 
the exact same, exact same thing works for, y, for mapping x into y. Because note that the condition number is independent. It, you can swap a and a inverse, and it's the same. So in fact, multiplication by a, in fact, the same analysis holds. Gives you exactly the same decrease, potentially, the same bound in decrease in accuracy as solving. So a and a inverse are kind of the same from that point of view. Okay. Now, what this says is you can only sort of, it, in, in terms of this bound, you can only decrease accuracy. And the only matrices that will not decrease accuracy are ones with condition number one. Condition number one means sigma max equals sigma min. That means all singular values are equal. And that, in fact, only occurs if a matrix is a multiple of an orthogonal matrix. Period. But it's actually, it's kind of obvious because you write u sigma v transpose. If, in fact, all the numbers on the diagonal of sigma are equal, which would happen if the condition number is 1, sigma is actually, it's something like sigma max, which is the same as all the sigmas, times i, this thing. That comes out, and it basically has the form sigma max i times uv transpose. That's going to be an orthogonal matrix. Okay? So this is why people who do, oh, let's say, certainly people who do numerical work, and people uh, at one end love orthogonal matrices. They'll do anything to, so that they're in their algorithms, they're multiplying by orthogonal matrices. For that matter, also solving equations with orthogonal matrices. And it's not just because it's easy to invert an orthogonal matrix, because it's the same as the transpose. It's not just that. It also has to do with the reliability. So various transforms you'll hear about, DCT, uh, the discrete Fourier transform, all sorts of trans, a lot of the trans, the common transformations you'd see actually have this form. Uh, the other people who love it are people in signal processing for the same reason. Uh, although the, the numbers are, are uh, the, the values of these things are off uh, considerably. Uh, if you're doing numerical analysis, um, you're, you're, you're worried about errors in floating point numbers. So you're, you're worried about out there at the 14th, 15th digit. If you're doing signal processing, you're probably uh, the third digit is probably suspect. But it's the same principle. That's the idea. Okay. Now, so the way you'd say this is if a matrix uh, has a, a small condition number, you say it's well conditioned. And, and it's called poorly conditioned if cap is large. Now, whether it's small or large, that depends entirely on the context. If around you are people who do numerical analysis and they're worried about the types of errors they're worried about are things like floating point round off. That, but that's all. That's all they're worried about. Then a matrix with a condition number of 1,000 would actually, in many cases, be considered well conditioned from, from a numerical analyst point of view. That would be well conditioned. Because you're, at that point, that's not a big enough number to have you worry about how floating point errors are going to propagate forward. If you're doing signal processing or if you're doing anything in an engineering context, then a condition number of 1,000 means that you can potentially lose 10 bits of accuracy. It means you can start with 14-bit with uh, signals, and you'll end up with something with 4 bits of accuracy. Or if you start with a 12-bit signal, uh, you'll end up with something with 2 bits of accuracy. So at, at which point, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of right at, at the boundary uh, of... Uh, of, of, so you're at the why bother boundary because you're just computing stuff that may not make any sense. Okay. Um, so poorly conditioned, if you do numerical analysis, that starts maybe at around 10 to the 6, goes up to 10 to the 8, things like that. 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8 in a signal processing or estimation or statistical context is, we have a name for a matrix like that, it's called singular. Uh, you know, meaning it's just why, it, there's no point. Uh, it just, it, it, anything you compute, if the numbers ever had anything to do with any actual me real measurement or something like that, uh, certainly can be complete nonsense. They might be right, and, but that, that's because this is just a bound here. And, but it says, it says that, that there's, you cannot give a mathematical argument that what you're computing has any, is nothing, it could be anything, could just be noise, an artifact of, uh, of your A to D or something like that. Okay. Now, by the way, the same analysis holds for least squares. If you have a non-square, um, you just have sigma max over sigma min. And here, 
Um, this is simply a dagger is put here. And it's exactly the same. So the same story uh, an analyzes uh, the, these things. OK. So that finishes up that. Like I said, that you can take an entire quarter that's on this topic and, uh, and related topics at Stanford. Probably there's multiple uh, quarters you can take that, that does this kind of stuff. This is very important to know. OK. One of our last, maybe our last topic, uh, almost last topic in, in the singular value decomposition has to do with low rank approximation. So actually, I mentioned this way early in the class. We talked about rank, and I said, well, if a matrix is low rank, you can write it as, as uh, B times C. You can make a, a skinny fat uh, factorization of the matrix. And we talked about applications of this and what it would mean. Um, for example, multiplying by A, if you have this factorization, is way fast. Now, so if this were a million by million matrix and I factored it as, first of all, I couldn't even store a million by million matrix. Let's start with that. Much less could I multiply a vector by it. But if it happened to have rank 10 and I factored it as million by 10, 10 by million, no problem. Okay? Not only can I store it, I can multiply by it, and the speed up factor is something just absolutely unimaginable. Okay? So we talked about application, sort of the idea of what does it mean if something's low rank? That's just one application. OK. At the time, I, I said this would become much more powerful when you have a method uh, for actually calculating. And by the way, we found a method for calculating B and C this way. QR factorization was one way to do it. So QR factorization did it right off the bat. So QR gave us a factorization, a skinny fat factorization. OK. okay. All right. Um, now, what's, I mentioned at the time, that later, we're going to have a method that does this. And then you have something like this. Now, this is actually really interesting, because it turns out there's lots and lots of matrices whose rank is a million, but which are almost rank 10. Now, you, already, you know what that means. It means you have a million by million matrix. And if you work out at singular values, they're all positive, say. Therefore, its rank is a million. But if, in fact, the singular values of a million by million matrix are big up to 10 and then precipitously drop. Then it doesn't, what that means is, but drop but remains positive. It means that matrix is almost rank 10. We're going to see how that works right now. That, that's this topic. That's, a, that's th this, the use of this is, a, I mean, there's so many uses, it's amazing. And there, there's many more, I'm sure, still to find. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So let's take. A matrix, it's an M by N, with rank R, and let's, that's its uh, SVD expansion here. So that's the SVD expansion. Now what we're going to look for is a matrix of rank P, which is less than R, and we want this to be a rank P approximation of A. How are we going to measure approximation? We're going to measure it by the norm of A minus A hat. Now that's the matrix norm, and so that means it's sort of, it's the worst case gain of the error. That's what it means. Okay. By the way, there are other ways to measure a difference. Uh, there's other norms on matrices. You'll encounter one, I guess, on this coming up homework or something like upcoming homework. You'll encounter one. Another one is something called the Frobenius norm. And the Frobenius norm is nothing but it's actually this. If you do, I'll, I'll write it this way. I think this works. It does. Okay. So. This says string A out as a vector and treat it as, as a vector in R, M, N. And this is nothing but this. It's the sum over I and J of the entries separately. It's that. Okay? And you'll have a homework problem on that. But it's, basically, it says, it says treat the coefficients of the matrix as a vector and take the ordinary Euclidean norm. Okay? So that's, that's another one. But this is the matrix norm. All right. Well, here's the solution actually for both cases. It's this. The optimal rank P approximation of a matrix A is given by this. You simply truncate the SVD. You write out the SVD. You gather P dyads if you want rank P. That's, that is, in fact, the optimal rank P approximation. And this norm, A minus A hat, it's, it, what's, what's left over is since A hat is the first chunk, it's the head 
of the SVD expansion. What's left is the tail of the SVD expansion. That's this. This matrix here has norm sigma p plus 1. Okay? So that's actually quite beautiful because it, it tells you also, it gives you an interpretation of actually what sigma 3 means. It's, it's actually quite beautiful, sigma 3. This, this gives you a perfect interpretation. It says it's the error by which, it's, it's, the, it's the error by which you can approximate A by a rank 2 matrix. That's what sigma 3 means. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, the, th this is completely intuitive. Um, it, it's by no, it's not obvious, uh, but it is intuitive. I mean, there, of course, there are a lot of things you have to remember that are intuitive and false. That's actually why you're here. Um, if everything intuitive were true, then we wouldn't need to do all this stuff. But anyway, so this is, this one is, this one sort of, ma this makes sense. It basically says something like this. You rank the dyads in order of importance. The sigma gives you the order of importance. And you take as many as you can afford in your rank budget, which is P. And that's, that's what it is. Okay. So this is what, this is what, it, this gives you the rank P approximate. Um, let me just point out, there's lots of, ex there's lots of applications of this immediately. Um, actually, it says here, it says that if you have to multiply, say, by a matrix many, many times, let's say in some real-time system, in a communication system, or in anything else, it doesn't really matter. You, wanna, you need to multiply by a matrix many, many, many times. Then what it says, for example, that might be some forward simulation, or who knows why you need to multiply by a matrix. Let's say you do. It says what you might want to do is take, look at the SVD of that matrix. Okay, that's offline. That, that could take uh, minutes or, or a day. It doesn't really matter to compute. You look at the SVD of A, and you decide how many singular values you feel are significant for your application. What kind of error will you accept? Then you, f you form actually just simply the leading, you choose a, a, a rank P, you get, a, you get a, a rank P approximation like this, like a rank 10 approximation. Now you have a method of multiplying by A approximately, because in fact, if you, if you truncated anything, you're no longer multiplying by A. But by the way, you can bound the error. You can never be off in a worst case sense by more than sigma P plus one times the norm of what went in. So, so this is not just approximation. It's approximation with a guaranteed bound. So you already have lots and lots of applications of, of, of this, of getting a low rank matrix. Um, for example, how do, you get, what's, how do you get a rank one approximation of a matrix? What's the best rank one approximation of a matrix? How would you get it? Rank one means I want to I want to write my matrix. A is B. Let's call it B C transpose like that. I want to write it like I want to write it as an outer product. How do I get the best outer product measure? You take the largest singular. You take U one. In fact, it's this here. I'll just write it out. It's sigma one U one V one transpose. That's it. That's the best rank one approximant of a matrix. Okay. Uh, let me ask a question. If I gave you this, for what would be the properties of the singular values of A that would lead you to suspect or know? I shouldn't say suspect. What are the properties of the singular values of A under which it can be well approximated by a rank one matrix? What is it? That's it. So. If, if, in fact, sigma 1 is much bigger than sigma 2, sigma 3, and all those, and those are small. Um, by the way, what is the exact condition that makes A rank 1? I mean, then there's only just one, it's sigma 1 equals 0, and if you, well, I'll, I'll, I'll use the loose interpretation of sigma 2. Sigma 2, sigma 3, and so on are 0, okay? But if sigma 2, sigma 3 are small, it says that, that will be well approximated by rank 1. So, Actually, I'd encourage you in anything you, you poke around in um, to, to, look at, to look at these things. Um, it, it's absolutely worth your while. Uh, there are shocking things occur all the time. So when you, you, you work out a matrix that, that means something, some mapping, some if you're doing something, look at the singular. In fact, it's, all, it's just good practice to know them and look at them all the time, just, just so you know kind of what's going on. 
Also, you'd be shocked. A lot of matrices that you think, or a lot of times you think you've measured a lot, or you think you have a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of, a lot of control, something like that. Uh, you have an airplane and you put all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of thrusters and things like that on it and little flaps and canards and vectored thrust. You think you are way, way overactuated. And a quick check of, of an appropriate SVD will tell you, you know, actually whether or not you really have now eight or 12 uh, actuators. You might only have three or something like that, roughly. I mean, but this, this is the kind of thing that would tell you that. OK. So let's go ahead and let's, let's prove this. We're going to show this in the case where the norm is the matrix norm. I, I should mention, this is a very, no, this is from maybe 1920 or something like that. I'd say it's the, the roughly, I could be wrong. But I, I, do, I, I know that it can be traced at least to like, I think it's, it's associated with a name Young or something like that. It's also a mainstay of a lot of uh, semi-modern computing. Uh, sorry, statistics. Semi-modern statistics is statistics after Fisher in the 20s, but before the most recent one based on a lot of uh, L1 and convex optimization methods. But that's another story. But so semi-modern was in the middle. That'd be 60s through 80s. And a lot of that is based on low rank approximation, SVD, all of this. There it's called PCA. Um, I should say that this is, this is actually a highly non-trivial result. There, there's, there are basically no other examples where any optimization problem involving rank constraints can be solved. No, absolutely none. The most minor variation on this problem, and it's, com it's impossible to solve. I, I just point this out because you know, some things are are close to solvable, others are not. For example, if you say, you know, I need, uh, I, I mean, if you add any other condition on, on these, it's just no one knows what the rank P approximation is. So it's, just, it's just this one little isolated result. But, okay, so let's, let's look at the proof of this. It's actually quite interesting how it works. Um, works like this. Let's suppose, let's let B be any other matrix whose rank is no more than P. Then let's look at the dimension of the null space of B. Well, that's got to be bigger than or equal to n minus p, because the rank of uh, the rank of b plus the dimension of the null space is going to be equal to uh, n. Okay, so that, that's that preservation of rank. So, in other words, if your rank is small, that says that your null space. If you have an upper bound on the rank, you have a lower bound on the dimension of the null space. They add up to a number n, so that's kind of obvious. Okay, now what we're going to do is this. I'm going to take v1 through vp plus one. These are from the SVD. These are the P, let's see, these are the P plus one most sensitive input directions. They're mutually orthogonal. This gives you, this here is, I would call, I'm gonna give a name for this. This is actually very important to get the right intuition here. Uh, certainly, span of V1 is simple. That's a line. And it is the line along, it's the input directions which are most, have the highest gain for the matrix A. Okay, span of V1 and V2 is a plane. It is the plane on which A has the highest gain. Now that's rough and it, you have to say exactly what that means in the right way, but that's sort of the idea. So this is something like the P plus one dimensional subspace along which A has the biggest gain. That's what this is. If, I'm just giving you the interpretation. This is nothing of what I just said is gonna be needed in the proof, it's just to interpret what this is. Okay, now the dimension of this is P plus one. Ah, very interesting. We're in Rn and we have the following. I have one subspace, that's null space of B, with dimension N minus P, and another, another subspace with dimension P plus one. They have to intersect, not just at zero. In fact, all subspaces intersect at zero. But they have to intersect at a point that's non-zero. So there has to be a unit vector z in Rn, which is in both this subspace and this one, right? Actually, if that were not the case, then if I, if I take the vector sum of the two subspaces, I'd get a, a subspace of dimension n plus 1 in Rn, which would substantially decrease my credibility. That's worse even than saying Thursday and writing Friday. So, okay. all right. So, all right, so let's see what it means. This says that BZ is zero, 
But z is in the span of this thing. Now you can also, you can actually see what's going to happen now. It basically says, remember, what I want to show is that basically b is not a good approximation of a. So b actually annihilates z. But z also happens to be in this sort of, this high gain subspace. So because z is in the span, it's going to get amplified by a by some minimum amount. And that's going to give me a bound on how good you could be. So a minus bz, well bz is zero, that's az. But az is this. But z actually here only ends up, uh, actually only comes into the first p plus one of these like that. But this thing here, sum vi transpose z squared from i equals one to p plus one is actually the norm of z squared, which is one. Okay? And the reason is z is in the span of v1 through vp plus 1. So that's what happens here. So these numbers add up to 1. These are, number, are non-negative numbers that add up to 1. And this is a combination of sigma i's from 1 to p plus 1 squared. So that's certainly bigger than the smallest one, which is sigma p plus 1 squared times norm z. And this says, I, I found a vector z whose length is 1. But when multiplied by a minus b, it came out with a norm sigma p plus 1, at least, or bigger. And that says that the gain of the matrix a minus b is bigger than sigma p plus 1. I should mention that, probably you ha you've done that on, on this homework a couple of times, but I'll just mention that. If I have a matrix a and I say, what is the norm of it? If it's bigger than 2 by 2, then you'd say, I can't answer that, I need a computer, or something like that. And then the person says, no, 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 please give me a bound or something on it, or, or roughly. Uh, then w w there's one thing that always works. If you find, if you find any non-zero z, and you just calculate this, that's a lower bound on the norm of a. But I think, I think you've, you've, maybe you've done that on like the homework that's due today or something like that. You've seen arguments like this. That's a lower bound on the norm, right? So, that's, that's the only, that's the argument I'm, I'm doing here. So this, this establishes this uh, low rank approximation uh, idea. And this allows us to say all sorts of cool stuff. It actually gives an, a beautiful interpretation of sigma i. It says that the ith singular value is the minimum matrix norm distance to a rank i minus one matrix. So it's, it's quite beautiful. That, that, that's what it says. So for example, uh, sigma 1, have I got this right? Does that look right? Let's see. Oh, no, no, sorry. That, that's right. Okay. So if I ask you for, uh, no, this, I'm looking at this. Am I confused? Who's, is that, is anyone, anyone else confused or is it just me? It looks completely wrong. Well, let's just go through it and, and, and see what, what it really is supposed to be. Um, is it n minus i plus 1? Mm. It's this? I'm just confused. It happens occasionally. Actually, more than occasionally. Okay, let's just, let's just try it here. Let's try, let's try sigma 2. So sigma 2 is the minimum to a rank. This should be n minus 1 or something matrix, actually. Um, I'm... I'm uh, is this right? What? What I have here is right? It is right. Okay. Sorry. That was just my, my confusion. That's it. it happens. Okay. So there you go. All right. We talked about this before. Sigma 3, if you want to know what is sigma 3, the interpretation is it's something like it's the, if sigma 3 is small, it says you're very close to a rank two matrix. That came out right, didn't it? And that's consistent with this. I wonder why I was confused. Anyway, I was just temporarily confused. All right. Um, very important one is if you, have, if you have an n by n matrix, the minimum singular value is the distance to the nearest singular matrix. So that, that's what that is. So that, that's that's what it means. So now you can see again, if you have a very small singular value for a matrix that's invertible, a square matrix that's invertible, 
many ways to say it. What, one way to understand it is to say your inverse is huge. That's one way. Another way to understand it now is you are very close. You may not, that matrix may not be, it is singular. It's not singular. It's not singular, but it's very close to a singular matrix. So if you have a minimum singular value of 10 to the minus 8, it says that matrix is not, it is not uh, singular. But there, I can perturb that matrix by another matrix, which is on the order of 10 to the, has a norm no more than 10 to the minus 8, and my new matrix will be singular. So that's what it says. Anyway, so that's, that's the interpretation uh, here. Let's look at an application, and I want to do one more application after this to finish up. Um, so the first, this application is just model simplification. This is kind of obvious, but suppose you have something like y equals ax plus v, where a is in 100, it's in 100 by 30, and it has singular values um, 10, 7, 2, 0 0.5, 0 0.01, and they go all the way down here. That's sigma 30 right there, and it's 0 0.0001, okay? Now norm x is on the order of 1, let's say. And this unknown noise here has norm on the order of 0 0.1. Okay, so that's, that's my model. It's just supposed to be rough, so don't worry about the exact numbers or anything like that. Now, this is actually quite interesting because if you, well, we can do some quick analysis here. Geometrically, we can say the following. If norm x is on the order of 1 and you don't know anything else about x, let's propagate x through A. Well, you can imagine the unit ball being propagated through A, and you're going to get an ellipsoid. Okay? And in fact, a very good name for that ellipsoid would be the signal ellipsoid. And in communications, that's exactly what you'd call it. It's the signal ellipsoid. It shows you kind of what would be the, the possible received signals if the input varies over a unit ball. right? And by the way, this might come up through some uh, transmitter power constraint or something like that. So, I mean, this is quite... It's, it's, it's quite close to uh, a lot of real problems. So you get this ellipsoid, which is a signal ellipsoid. Now, that ellipsoid looks like this. It's got some big semi-axes, 10, 7, 2, 0 0.5, 0 0.01. What's interesting about it is this. To that ellipsoid, I mean, that's the signal, but it basically says that then, then the signal is corrupted by something, a norm of 0.1. And what you can see immediately is that basically, all of these signals are sort of lost. They're corrupted by the noise. They're bigger. Uh, in other words, this thing you can imagine as a ball of uh, radius 0.1. Then you have this ellipsoid, which actually is, has positive volume. Um, it's got some really thin dimensions. It's got 26 thin dimensions. In fact, 26 of the dimensions are much thinner than this. And what that really tells you is, is you really for all practical purposes, this A is rank 4. Does this make sense? And in fact, you can even talk about the signal-to-noise ratio. You can, when you can talk about the signal-to-noise ratio. Here, it's 1,000. Down here, you're down to a signal-to-noise ratio of about 5 to 1. Here, it's the other way around. It's 1 to 10. So, or minus 20 decibels, or whatever, however, whatever you want to call it over here, and so on. So you'd basically say that for all practical purposes, this simplified model here is going to be absolutely equivalent. Now, this might be depressing because this might have been a measurement system. And you might have thought you had a 3.3 to 1 measurement to parameter you want to measure advantage. Turns out you're wrong. It's the other way around. You actually measured four things, even though you thought you measured 100. Does this make sense? So this is, I mean, don't read too much into it. This is sort of the... the this is just sort of the, the typical application. Now, I want to do one, uh, one more application that I realized this morning should have been in the notes. I don't know why it's not. I guess it will be next year, depending on if I remember to put it in. And it's this. Um, let's go, I want to go back to the, sort of the beginning. Uh, let's w rewind back to like the third or fourth week, third week of the class. And I want to ask you this. Suppose I had a bunch of vectors, A1 through A. Let's just make it specific, though. So let's A100, and these are in R10, okay? So I have 100 vectors in R10. By the way, these could be snapshots of something I've measured. I mean, who knows what they are? It could be 10 uh, stock prices over 100 periods. It could be anything. It's just a, it's a block of data. And now I'm going to ask you the following question. 
And I could have asked you this question week three. I could ask you the following. How would you determine if these 100 measurements, these 100 vectors in R10, actually live in a subspace of dimension three? First of all, let's decide what that means. First, let me ask you this, first of all. Could any human being detect that? Totally out of the question. Absolutely out of it. If I showed you 10 numbers and you looked at, you could look at them all, oh, unless, unless it's stupid, like, for example, the first number is always the same, like it's always one, okay? But let's, let's assume it's, it's a generic case. I just show you, I say, look, here are some prices, 100 long, 100 last trading days, here it is. Any comments? No human being can look at it and go, whoa, those are in a three-dimensional subspace, okay? <laughs> Can't do it. Out of the question. Now, so let me ask you, how would you do it computationally? But QR, exactly. You'd simply take this as a matrix and you'd run QR. And you know what would happen? You'd pick a first one, second one, third one, you'd run, you'd run the QR that doesn't dump core when the matrix is less than full rank. Okay? You'd, you'd run a modified QR, you'd, you'd run it, and it would run through 100 vectors, and it will have generated a rank only three, Q, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3, and you'll have an orthonormal. And by the way, the, impl the, in the implication of this is very interesting. Because you would say, you know, that price data was really interesting. It turns out it's only, it varies in a three-dimensional subspace. Um, by the way, what would that mean? What would be the interpretation? Suppose prices varied in a three-dimensional subspace. What does it mean? What does it mean? You can do what? There you go. Yeah, that's, that's a perfectly good way to say it. It basically says that instead of just treating these as a bunch of random, it would say it just looks like random 10 vectors. No human being could look at 10 vectors and say, say what was, something was fishy about them. But what this would say is, this analysis would say, actually, those prices depend only on three underlying factors. And it would allow you stunning abilities. Like, for example, given, I guess, a cup, given, I guess, I guess the right way to say it would be three, seven. Sorry, if I gave you seven of the prices, you could predict the other three. Did that come out right? Yeah, okay, that's what it is. So, so if you want to know what's the practical consequence of, of knowing this fact, it's amazing. It's basically, given seven prices, you can predict flawlessly the last three. I think that's right, isn't it? Other way around? Wow. It's funny, I had a double espresso this morning. Huh. I'm back three shots. That's it, that's my, that's, I don't know, I'm just not fully, uh, not all the cylinders are firing. Okay, right. Well, it's even more stunning then. Okay, all right. Given three, you can predict the rest of the other seven. But what I said technically was true, just for the record here. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's fine. Now, do you imagine that stock prices are exactly in a, in a three-dimensional subspace? No, that was rhetorical. No, of course not, right? Okay. Um, I mean, do you imagine received signals in some multiple antenna system are in the three? No, of course not. Okay. But now, you, have a, you now know how to detect if these vectors are almost in a subspace of rank three. Or if the, if the if, well, let's see. The range of these is definitely R10. But you can now detect whether the range of these is like almost R3 or something like that. So somebody tell me, how do you do it? You just take the SVD of this matrix. You just take the SVD of, the, of this data matrix. And, and what will you see if you take the SVD of this data? If just you take the stupid data and you type SVD of A. What, will, what would tip you off that, that that data is almost in a three-dimensional subspace? Yeah, you'd see three substantial singular values, and then you'd see a nice, strong drop. And sigma 4 up to sigma whatever we had, 10, would be small but positive. And by the way, what that would mean is if you took these points and thought of them, if you think of geometrically, it says take these points and make a cloud in R10. Now, I don't know how your R10 visualization skills are, 
but I'll tell you what mine are. And since I appear to not even be able to get, have, did you notice that both the mistakes I made today were of the same nature? They're, it's a kind of an I, N minus I confusion. Hmm, I, 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 we'll see. If it continues, I'll, I'll go to a neurologist and they'll find out there's some lesion in some part of my brain. Where, anyway, let's move on. Maybe that was the lesion talking up. Uh, all right, let's move on here. If you, if you were to visualize these in R10, of course, if you could visualize vectors in R10, you could say, oh, let me see some more price data. And you could look at it and you could go, hang on just a minute. And you could go like this or whatever. And you go, whoa, wow, man, that's, a three, that's an, almost a three-dimensional subspace. But no one can do that. So, so what, but if you could do that, you would see a cloud of points. And the cloud of points would actually, uh, it, it would actually, it, the SVD tells you something about this. It tells you that in some directions, it would, the cloud would have a big extent. But in seven directions, it would be quite small. That's what you'd know. And you'd, so you'd say, that's how you'd be able to say that this thing vary, it's, it's roughly in, in, uh, in R3. Oh, and by the way, how would you actually then calculate the, the, the so-called factor model in this case? How would you calculate, for example, an orthonormal basis of that three-dimensional subspace, of the price subspace? First three U's, end of story. First three U's with U1, U2, U3. That's your. That's an orthonormal basis for that subspace. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this is. I guess it's not in the notes because this is basic and obvious, and this is just the definition of what SVD is. But still, this is the kind of thing you can you you can do, and actually, I can change that and say will do um, using the singular value decomposition. So. Um, okay. So that actually finishes up essentially our last uh, topic and real topic in the course. Uh, so that's, that's it. Um, the next topic we're going to look at is, has to do with this idea of, uh, that we're going to look at the idea of controllability and observability. Um, it's interesting stuff. Actually, more than anything, what it shows is that once you understand everything up till today's lecture, everything else is nothing but a trivial application of it. So all other topics and things like that just follow from everything we've done up till now, period. So there's a sense in which the class is over now. Um, and then you can treat the, the other topics as just interesting applications, just cool stuff you can do with these ideas. Is it, yes? I did. Oh, what, what, are you asking what's the difference between the Q, Q? Oh, what's the relationship? Yeah, I can say a little bit more about that. Let me say that. Um, if, these, if these price vectors, let's make them price vectors. If, the price, if these are price vectors or price change vectors or whatever, return vectors, if these are price change vectors like that, um, and they're not exactly in a, 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 a dimension three subspace here, um, and you run the QR factorization on it, what do you get? Yeah, you, you get the full, you get a Q that's n by n. The thing is full rank. You get a Q that looks like this, and you get an R, you know, which looks like that. Okay? And that's it. That's your QR factorization. Okay? It doesn't really tell you a whole lot in this case. Okay? Whereas the SVD, if you write out, write out the full SVD, you get the same, you get the same thing as this. You'll, you'll get some, no, not, sorry, not the same shape. Not the same thing. Um, so the SVD is what would allow you, whereas the rank revealing QR would not. Um, by the way, if sigma 4 gets small enough, it will trigger your rank revealing algorithm to decide that it's rank 3. But it would have to be, that's, that's a parameter in that method, and it, has to, and it has to be set right. And it would normally be set way low. And it would not be triggered by anything that came from data. Okay. So, okay. So that would be the, that's the difference between a so-called rank revealing QR. Uh, and rank revealing QR is, a, is something we looked at week three. So that sort of, uh, that's, that wasn't yet quantitative. That was a, at, at week three, when someone said rank to you, it, 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 well, it means what rank means. It has a mathematical definition. And in that case, this would be rank 10, period. This price, real price data would be rank 10. Now, 
Now that you know about uh, things like the singular value decomposition, rank is a fuzzier concept, although I should say something about that. Rank by itself means rank. It's the mathematical definition of rank. And if anyone says, what's the rank of this data matrix, the answer is 10. You must, if you're going to use a fuzzy definition of rank, you must qualify it. You must say something like, if someone says, what's the rank of that, you could say 10. You could say, but awfully close, it's awfully close to rank 3. It's well explained by, by, by three factors. And it's per, almost perfectly explained by four factors. That, that would be acceptable. But you can't just say the rank of this is 3. So everybody see what I'm saying? I mean, of course, once, once you're doing this kind of stuff and you're on the, you know, people on the streets, they say things like that all the time. But anyway, just, just so singular means singular, non-singular means singular, rank means rank, null space means null space, period. So however, if you have a couple of singular values that are really tiny, you can call that the almost null space. Um, if, if you were writing or if there were lawyers present, I would not call it the null space. You could say it's, it's the practical null space, or for the purposes of this problem, for the purposes of this application, it's the null space or whatever. So, but I'm wandering all around, and I'm not answering your question. The question was, what's the difference between A equals QR and A equals U sigma V transpose? Was that the question? Yeah, that's roughly. Today, I'm going to take that as encouragement. Um, okay, all right. So. Uh, I will tell you what the relations are. Ready? Um, and let's, let's do this case where it's full rank and fat or whatever. Here, here's the relation. That's orthogonal and that's orthogonal. Um, v transpose and R have the same size. That's pretty much it. And you can say a few more things. I mean, there are some subtleties you could say about the size of the elements of the diagonal of R and sigma, but they're much more fancy and advanced. So basically, there's not much uh, you can say ab about the two. I mean, there are, but they're, they're more advanced topics. They're not simple things. Did I answer your question, which was not actually your question, but you were polite enough to suggest that it was close enough? Yes, good. OK, great. Had that been your question, would I have answered it? <laughs> good, OK. Next topic. Um, I mean, unless there's any other questions about SVD. OK, I'll, uh, oh, did you have a question? Yeah. So the first three vectors in U explain that's an orthonormal the first three vectors in U is an orthonormal basis for the the three dimensional subspace that the A's are approximately in. I think that came out right. Was that the question? Okay. And you might ask actually then what the three V's are. V one, V two, V three. That's interesting. But I'll let you think about it. But that, that, that's what it is. And actually, it's actually quite interesting uh, in, in this context of, say, if these were price changes or return vectors, let's say. You might ask, what do V2, V1, V2, and V3 mean? Now, they're, if they're transposed, they're, they're like this, right? That's a, you would get something that looks like this. One, two, three, and then something that looks like that. Now, there's some sigmas in there, but you can shove the sigmas either way you like. So there it is. So, in fact, go ahead. Let's go ahead and answer it. What do you think these are? Let's say this is time. So the index represents time. It's closing, closing returns, closing day returns. What do you think these three are? They're very interesting. What, you have a guess? Well, this, is, this basically says what's driving the returns on the prices there's just three, three underlying factors. They're not totally random and unrelated. There's three underlying factors. This actually is the time history of those three segments of the economy. That's what it is. And you can look at the first one and you could say, oh, that's related to interest rates. Oh, that's real. I'm totally making this up, by the way. There's probably people in here who know much more about this than I am. But I know enough to know that actually you, this is, that's what that is. That's what you get. So these actually gives you the hist time history. If this means time, this is history. In signal processing, these would be the actual recovered signals, okay? And this would, be, this would be the subspace in which those signals lie, okay? 
So that would be the example. But, but these are, are best understood by just doing problems. So, yeah? No, it would not be. So if, if you did the singular value analysis of this and all 10 were significant, none, sigma 10, for example, was not, particular, was not small enough that you could say anything about it, that means basically that this cloud of points, again, if you were able to do R10 visualization, kind of extends about the same in all directions. That's kind of what it says. And it'd be, you know, be like, no. By the way, that might be a good thing, might be a bad thing. It's bad if your goal is to predict the value of seven of these components from given three. It's bad. Um, but for other reasons, it might, for other applications, it might be good. But no, in that case, um, well, it, it, it actually depends. Uh, no, it, but it wouldn't be the same. No. I'll just leave it at that. No. There's be no, no connection between them then. Okay. Yeah. These? Uh, no, these are the 10 vectors, and that's an orthonormal basis. It, basically, the assertion is this. Every one of these 100 vectors is very well approximated by some linear combination of these three. That's what it says. No. They're, no, they're uh, V1, V. This is the transposes here. So this, is, this, this thing here is V1 transpose, V2 transpose, V3 transpose, like that. The Vs are 100 vectors. They're 100 long vectors, okay? Because this, this data block is 10 by 100. So the V is also 10 by 100. So V transpose, uh, I came out wrong, anyway, sorry. V, v transpose is also 10 by 100. Okay, yes? Yeah. Yeah, and it would be terrible. Right. So if all the singular values of a matrix are the same, actually, we talked about that earlier today. That's basically, that, that is a, a matrix with condition number one, but you can say a lot about that, um, and that it should be or was or will be a homework problem for you, I think. But in, if, I mean, if we were on the ball, we may have accidentally not assigned that, but it basically, the homework problem, it may not even exist, but it would go like this. Uh, <laughs> I'm losing it. Uh, it would go like this. Um, a matrix has condition number one, if and only if it's a multiple of an orthogonal matrix. Why is that? Because it looks like U sigma V transpose, but all the sigmas are the same. Therefore, sigma is a multiple of the identity, and therefore it pops outside, and it really looks like lowercase sigma U V transpose. That's, an ortho that's a multiple of an orthogonal matrix, right? So that would be great. Matrices like that make, just bring tears to the eyes, tears of, of joy to the eyes of people who do numerical analysis, signal pro for, like for signal processing, that's like, that's the best channel you could possibly have because you're not gonna lose any, anything. It means you, you, get, you thought you had 10 dimensions, you paid for 10 antennas, 10 receivers, they're all paying off. You see what I'm saying? Now in terms of if that were data and you were analyzing it, that'd say, well, so much for that. I mean, if you're analyzing data, it just means, well, it's all over the place. In fact, it's even worse. It's just, it's ba in a balanced way, it kind of goes all over the place. So the, the, you, haven't, you haven't figured out any underlying uh, um, uh, structure in, in there. I don't know if this makes sense. If, if, a, if, if A actually is a channel in a communication system, for example, and it has only three significant singular values, that's bad uh, because basically it says that the gain in three directions is significant, but then after that, they're, so, and then you think, but I paid for 10 transmitters and 10 receivers. And what this says is you, you, you paid for 10, for all practical purposes, you're getting three. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm answering questions all around yours. I'm sort of surrounding it. What do you think? Actually, what was your question? <laughs> You've forgotten now. What? Yes, that would be correct. If all the singular values of a matrix are the same, I, then I had a long, incoherent discussion of what that means. It means it's a multiple of an orthogonal matrix, right? Then it says 
this is not a good candidate for low rank approximation because basically any approximation you make, you make is going to be terrible. Why? Because the thing kind of pokes in all directions. So approximating it by uh, something of lower rank is going to give you a huge error. Basically 100% error is what it's going to give you. Okay. All right. I think I'm, I think we're done. All right. So let's look at the next, next topic, which like I said is, a, is an application. It's controllability and state transfer. So we'll, we'll look and see how this, uh, what this, what the idea is. So we consider a, a linear dynamical system. The truth is we've already done sort of these problems. This just kind of formalizes a bunch of it. This could be homework problems really, but. So let's take x dot equals ax plus bu or a discrete time system over some time interval ti, tf. That's initial and final. Um, now, of course, these are integers in the case of a discrete time system and these are real numbers and that's, a, that's an actual real number interval in the case of a continuous time system. So you say that an input, now an input is a trajectory or something like, it's a function that maps this interval, the time interval into Rm. You say that it steers or transfers the state from the initial state to the final state over that time interval. And then you have immediate questions like, for example, um, given a state, an initial state, what can you transfer it to at the final time? All states, uh, you know, what, what can you do? What, what are your degrees of freedom? If you think of you as a joystick or something like that, or a possible input, the question is, what, what can you pull off over that time interval? Um, if you can transfer it to some target state, then the question is, like, how quickly can you do it? Can you do it in uh, three seconds? Can you do it in one? Uh, what's the minimum time it takes to transfer a given state to a target state? Um, by the way, often the target state would be zero. Zero, remember this is all, zero means some equilibrium position, like some vehicle, at, you know, uh, an airplane flying at, at, at some, uh, some trim position. And then the question would be, how fast can you bring uh, after after some disturbance like a wind gust, how fast can you bring it back uh, to the zero state? Zero meaning that it's back at the trim condition, for example. Or it could be an industrial process or something like that here. Or this could be network flows or it could be an economy or something like that. It's, it's, all, it's all the same, at least in this class. If you're in those individual classes, it's not all the same. So, okay. And then the question would be, how do you find one that transfers you from some initial state to a final one? And then the question would be, how do you find a smaller efficient one that transfers you from one state to another? And these are the, these are the types of questions. You can make up zillions more, um, but these are the types of questions uh, that we can actually answer. In the discrete time case, by the way, we can answer it all now, uh, basically. You, you know all the answers. You don't need to know anything else. So let's look at reachability. Um, Reachability studies the question of, of, of taking an initial state of zero and, and going to some state x of t. So the question, then you say x of t is reachable, and if, if it's a discrete time second, uh, system, you'd say in t seconds. If it's, dis sorry, it's continuous time, you'd say it's in t seconds. If it is discrete time, or whatever the time units are, you'd say in, in t periods or t epochs is what you would say um, in the discrete time case. Well, we'll let RT be the set of points reachable in T seconds or epochs. And that would be something like this for a continuous time system. It's the set of all n vectors that look like that because this thing here is x of t when you start at x equals zero. That's the formula for mapping an input over an interval zero t into the final state. You multiply by b, you put the exponential there and you get that, okay? And this is, in, this, is a, this is a huge infinite dimensional set here. It's the set of all possible inputs that map 0t into Rm, okay? Discrete time system, it's much simpler. It's actually, it's the set of all things of this form where u of t is an Rm. So here, the parameter that parameterizes this description is finite dimensional. So here, um, I should say something like this, maybe t equals uh, zero up to t minus one, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Okay? So that's what this would be. So it, it actually has dimension t m, this thing. Okay. Now these are subspaces. That's easy to show directly. Uh, it's also easy to just, well, 
basically it's easy to show directly. Um, it has an interesting implication to say it's a sub subspace. To say it's a subspace says the following. It says if you can reach a state in, T sec in three seconds, let's say, it says, and you can reach another state in three seconds, it says you can reach, for example, the sum state. And by the way, what input do you think you'd use? Well, the sum of the corresponding input. So, I mean, you'd have to check that and all that, but it would work out, and that's how that works. Okay. Now, the other thing is that if you can reach, if you can reach, uh, you have this. RT is a subset of RS if, R, if S is bigger. This says that the number, the, the points you can reach in 3.6 seconds is a superset of the set of points you can reach in 1.5. I'll write those down, 3.61 point, because otherwise I'm going to forget them. Okay. And actually, let's argue that. Oh, do you not believe it? Is that only true in continuous time? Can... No, it's true in discrete time, too. Can you just reach them before two seconds and not at two seconds? Because, like, maybe you could. No, that's, that's the heart of my next question, but it's a great, great question. So I'll, I'll summarize your, your, your question. Um, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. It was like, that's completely wrong, I think was your, that's a, that, well, that's, that's maybe not, put much more politely, but that was the question. Okay. Um, so let's, let's figure this out. Um, so I claim if you can hit a state in 3.6 seconds, you can hit it in one, no, sorry. It's just, it's one of those days. You have them. Every quarter you have one, two. Okay, let's try it again. This is where I'd really like to be able to edit those videos. Boy, would I like to. It'd be a really short, it'd buffer up like real fast. It'd be about 12 minutes. So, okay, let's try it again. If you can reach a state in 1.5 seconds, you can reach it in 3.6, right? And your intuition was that that might, that might not be the case. So someone tell me how to do that. How do you do it? You, okay, so, you, so you, you first you reach 1.5 and then take your hands off the controls. Uh, ooh, okay, I'm getting two different. Okay, so you said you want to get there in 3.6 seconds, get there in 1.5 and take your hands off the, the accelerator. That's zero. That's U equals zero. You take that back. <laughs> okay, it's formally retracted. It's retracted. And the reason that doesn't work is because you get there at 1.5. Great, you're at the target state. Take your hands off the thing. And what's propagating you forward? E to the TA. Okay, so you, you're going to drift. So 3.6 seconds, you will not be where you want to be. All right. But there's a minor variation on that, which I heard kind of in a, uh, actually I heard 10 answers coming at me, but they were kind of in a two-dimensional subspace. Sorry. Let, um, no, let's, sorry. So, um, they were, at, well, anyway. All right. So. The correct way to do it is to do nothing for, do you think I can subtract these? 3.6, that's tough. Okay, you do nothing for, I'm going to do it, 2.1 seconds. There you go. I, I got my stride back, okay? You do nothing for 2.1, now, when you're doing, if you do nothing, normally you drift. Ah, but here, you started from zero. Are you cool now? You, Get the distinction? Uh, you got it. It will not work. And in fact, you're, if you don't start from zero, you're absolutely right. Where you can get to, from, you know, if you can get from one place to another 1.5 seconds, there's no reason to believe you can do it in a longer time period. Uh, like, yeah. But if you start from zero, that works. Okay. Everybody got that? So, all right. So that's it. And you say the reachable set is a set of the points that you can get to at any time. So if you can get there, at all, in any amount of time, that's called the reachable set. Okay. So we can actually analyze this completely, about 15 seconds for discrete time linear dynamical systems, because this uses all the ideas we know and love at this point. So discrete time system, xt plus 1 is axt plus bu of t. Um, then I can write this. The state at time t, I will stack my inputs over 0 up to t minus 1. I'll stack them. So that's a big vector in R. T, M, like that. And I'll just write it out as a matrix, and that matrix looks like that. And it's got a name. It's called the, I guess it's called the controllability matrix. Some people call this the reachability matrix or something. But it's got names like that. 
Okay? And the matrix looks like this. Um, it's B, A, B, up to AT minus 1B. And by the way, it should be absolutely no mystery as to what these are. What this says, oh, notice that I chose to stack the U's in reverse time. Why? I don't, oh, just so this matrix would come out with, with ascending powers of A, not descending powers of A. But anyway, so I've stacked my U's in reverse time. But anyway, so if you do that, this says that how does U T minus 1, which is actually the last input that has any effect on X of T, how does it affect X of T? And the answer is just by B. To dynamics, makes no difference. This says U of T minus 2, that's your penultimate action. It's the action before the last one. That's U T minus 2. That gets multiplied by AB. That should make perfect sense to you. B tells you the immediate action on X of T minus 1. A then propagates that effect forward in time, one step. Okay? So that's what this matrix is, very famous matrix. Looks like this. Um, oh, by the way, the matrix comes up in other contexts. It's a, it's a huge topic in large-scale scientific computing and things like that, except they, don't, they call it a Krylov matrix there. So just, just I mentioned this just because you'll see this matrix, actually not with a vector. Uh, B will be a vector in that case, but anyway. Okay. So it turns out, so now it's real simple. We have a name for, well, we have a name for it. It's the, the, the reachability subspace at time t is actually the range of this matrix. The matrix grows. If I increase t, and now I can ask you any question at all, and I could have asked it even, I didn't need any of this to ask you, but now I can say, I have a discrete time system, I start at zero, I give you a target state to hit, and I ask you, give me the minimum number of time steps it takes to hit that target. One possible answer is, you'll never hit it. We haven't quite gotten there, but anyway. So, how do you solve that? Could have done that week three. How'd you do it? Okay, so what you do is this. You take, first I ask you, can you hit the target vector in zero steps? Can you? There is one case you could do that. If the target, if the target state is zero, then you, the person who asked you this, you go back and you say, pardon, you're already there, it's done. And they'd say, amazing, I'm glad you took that class. Um, okay, if it's, now it's, let's say t equals one, can you hit it in one step? The only things you can get to in one step is of the form B U. Well, U of zero, okay? That's, that's, that's what X of one can be, okay? And so the answer is this. You can get, you can hit a, a target, X sub target can be hit in one step if and only if it's in the range of B. Notice that A plays no role whatsoever. If you can hit it in two steps, you check if X target is in the range of B and then AB. If it's in the range, done. That's it, you can, you can hit it. If it's not, you cannot. So you simply keep increasing these until X target is in the range of them. Make sense? That's it. So that, everybody, this is basic, so that's, um, that, that's the idea. Um, okay, that'll give, you the, that'll give you absolutely the minimum time required to hit a given target state. Now, by the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, it turns, you know, once you get to A to the N, a to the n is a linear combination of i, a, a, a squared up to a n minus 1. And that means, basically, when you get a to the n, b here, you're adding m columns, but they are, at, for sure, they're linear combinations of the previous ones. And actually, Cayley-Hamilton theorem now has a very interesting implication in a dynamic system. It says the following. It says that after n steps, the range the, the, the range of uh, the RT is equal to RN, period. So it basically says this. In principle, the set of points you can hit grows with each T. By the way, it need not, but it grows with each T. But once you hit N, it will never get bigger. That's it. So when you take N here, that's called the controllability matrix, and people say that the system is controllable if the controllability matrix is rank n. And that basically says you can hit any point in n steps. That's what it says. Actually, uh, it, by the way, it may not be a good idea to hit it in n steps. You may want to hit it in more, but at least in principle, you can hit any point in, in n steps. And I think we'll, we'll stop there, which is 
good idea, unless I can think of one last terrible gaffe I can get in, but I can't think of any, so we'll quit here. <laughs>